Let's give ourselves an overview or synthesis of all that we've learned about plant and animal cells. And what I have over here on the left, this is supposed to be indicative of an animal cell. Animal cell. And what I have on the right, this should be indicative of a plant cell. Plant cell. So let's start with the what's outside of the cell. So we see in both of them, we see the extracellular matrix. You see on this animal, or outside of this animal cell, you see all these collagen fibers and everything else, all these fibers that are holding these cells into place and allow the cells to relate to each other. And actually, the, depending on what's inside of it, can even help signal different things to the cells. So this is an extra cellular matrix. Now when we think about the extracellular matrix for a plant cell, we also think about the, some of the components that are involved in the actual cell wall. And so the cell wall is a key difference between plant and animal cells. So cell, the cell wall is going to be in a plant cell. Animal cells don't have cell walls. Now, if we go one layer deeper, we get to the plasma membrane, the cellular membrane, and we see that that is common to both. The animal cell is going to have a plasma membrane, and the, and the plant cell is going to have a plasma membrane. And they actually can both have tunnels from neighboring cells, or, or, or tunnels between neighboring cells. We studied that in the cell wall video for plant cells. We saw these things right over here called plasmodesmata, and we actually see a complete one over here because I start to draw a little bit of an adjacent cell. Plasmo Plasmodesmata. Desmata. And in animal cells, the analog are gap junctions, which are still tunnels between adjacent cells. So gap, gap junctions. Now, plasmodesmata are much more common to a much wider category of plant cells than gap junctions. But gap junctions can be very relevant in certain types of animal cells, in particular things like heart cells, where because of gap junctions between adjacent cells, electrical signals can move through the tissue and let adjacent cells know, hey, it's time to contract in the right way. So this is still very crucial for certain types of animal cells. So now let's go a little a, a layer even deeper. And actually, before I do that, I, I want to reemphasize this. And I do this in, in almost every video. All of these membranes that we draw, either the outer cellular membrane or the membranes of these organelles, these are all lipid bilayers or phospholipid bilayers. So if I were to zoom in right over there on this yellow place right over there, it looks just like a line, but it really is, it really is a, it, they really are these phospholipid these phospholipid bilayers that have these hydrophilic heads that point outwards and these hydrophobic tails that point inwards. And it keeps going. I want to make that very clear. These lipid bilayers, all of these membranes that I draw are lipid bilayers. But let's keep on going. So as we go now into the cell, we so see that both of these cells have cytoskeletons. We have cytoskeletons. So you have your microfilaments right over here, microfilaments right over here. And I'm not giving full justice to the complexity just because we want to be able to have a fairly simple looking diagram. You have your microtubules, microtubules. You might have intermediate filaments. And we talk about all of those things in other videos. But now let's dig a little bit, a little bit deeper. So in the animal cells, I have these centrosomes. And they are key for organizing the microtubules. And we're going to see them a lot when we talk about mitosis. We don't see them in plant cells. They actually figure out ways, other ways to organize their microtubules, especially, well, in general, and especially even when we're thinking about something like mitosis. But let's see what other differences are here. Well, one big thing that you might notice is this big blue balloon egg looking thing. And it doesn't contain these green things. It's really just behind these green things. And this is these tend to be associated with plant and fungal cells. And this is a central vacuole. Central vacuole. And a central vacuole it can store fluid. It can store enzymes. It can be viewed as a place for waste. And it actually turns out that even though uh, they're common to plants, that depending on which plants, which cells, they can have very different roles. And I want to emphasize this to you. And I do this in other videos. We keep seeing all these organelles, and we can draw picture, we can draw diagrams of them, and we think we know what most of their functions are. But almost all of these organelles, and all of actually the cell, is area. It's an area of active. 
research. And in the decades to come, we're going to find more and more things that these different organelles do and ways that they signal to each other and interact with each other and behave in different circumstances. So we're starting to understand what's there and have an idea of what they do. But in the decades to come, we're going to learn much, much, much more about the different structures and functions of a cell. But as I mentioned, this is central vacuole. It's large. It can help provide structural support for the cell. It can help store things. And the best analog on the animal cells, some animal cells actually can have a vacuole, not, not all of them. But the best analog is the lysosome. So this right over, just in the orange color, this right over here is a lysosome. 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 And a lysosome could be viewed as the waste disposal of an animal cell, where it's going to have a bunch of, uh, of, of enzymes in it so that it, things can kind of go in there and get broken up. It has a, low, a, a relatively low pH, a, a more acidic pH, so that things can be broken up in different ways. And then their, their individual pieces can be recycled. And since we're in this category of places where things go to get maybe broken down or catabolized or metabolized in certain ways, it's also worth talking about the peroxisomes. 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 So the peroxisomes, we actually see in both of them. And they're named that way because when they were first studied, they said, hey, there's something going on here where the, the, there's some oxidation reactions going on here where it seems like the final uh, byproduct seems to be hydrogen peroxide. And so that's why they were named peroxisomes. And we're still understanding exactly all of the things that they do, but we know that they're important for, for, for cutting up long chain fatty acids so that they can be more uh, usable by other parts of the cells but they also have other roles and all of their all of their mechanisms are still not still not fully understood now going back to differences between the plant cell and the animal cell a key difference is going to be these characters right over here these are chloroplasts this is where photosynthesis takes place and clearly we're going to show it in the plant cell this is how they take they are able to create they're able to to create essentially a food or, or I guess you could say fixed carbon based on light energy. So let me see, chloroplast, chloro, chloroplast right over there. We do not see that in the animal cell. Now, when we're talking about energy, we talk about the ATP factories of cells, and we find this in both of these cells, and that, of course, are the mitochondria. And we see the mitochondria in both of the cells. And then the other things, we also see a lot of common things. We see a Golgi, we see the Golgi apparatus in that cell. We see Golgi apparatus in that cell. And that's where we package proteins for uh, use either within the cell or outside of the cell. We have the endoplasmic reticulum. We have the rough endoplasmic reticulum that has ribosomes bound to the membrane. And we have the smooth where you don't have the ribosomes. And this is where a lot of proteins get manufactured, but, include, and all, but even lipids also can get manufactured. Then you have, of course, the nuclear membrane. Actually, this is the inner nuclear membrane right over here. The outer nuclear membrane is contiguous with the endoplasmic reticulum. But you see that in both of these cells. And inside, of course, you have the DNA. It's in chromatin form. And then you have this kind of extra dense area that shows up in microscopes, which we call the nucleolus, which is associated, which is associated with ribosomal, with ribosome formations and ribosomal RNA. And of course, you also have free ribosomes. Free. You also have free ribosomes. So this is a very high level overview of cells, eukaryotic cells, I should say. But hopefully it also starts to, to show you some of the key distinctions between animal and plant cells.